multimedia reporter here at American Muslim Today. Um, I will be doing the interview with you today, so thank you for joining us. Yeah, so if you just want to start by telling us about yourself, your background, um, and I'm going to ask you specifically because we are American Muslim today and uh, you are a Muslim woman yourself. So can you tell us specifically why it's important for you to be taking on this uh, leadership role? Good morning. Uh, my name is Melissa Chowdhury. I'm a candidate for Congress here in Washington's 9th District. Um, I am an American Muslim woman. I reverted a few years ago, um, but I've always felt a deep sense of surrender and guidance um, with my higher power, and that is the essence of Islam. Uh, it took a while to, for uh, me to find someone who brought me to the Quran, but alhamdulillah. It's been, so I believe American Muslims, broadly speaking, need to step up into leadership and into taking ownership of our role in the society and the, our right to help shape its future. One of the things that I say, specifically as a white American, where the racism and the xenophobia bounces off me a little bit. It doesn't, like Islamophobia, I still get, but it doesn't intersect with that anti-immigrant sentiment in the same way. People can hear me differently when I say that liberty and justice for all is a Muslim value as much as it's an American value. And we believe in values of compassion and tolerance and justice and peace. And most people don't know that. I would like for many more white Americans to know that. I'd like for that to be much more prevalent in the halls of power. And we have the opportunity, and I believe the obligation, um, to participate in the political process. Um, as Muslims, we have an obligation to strive against injustice. We have an obligation to improve the societies we're in and to not be complicit in oppression, including our own. And right now, the way to effect those changes in American policy specifically is through politics. I was in Pakistan earlier this year, and that's... In, in many ways, that's kind of where the seed of this this race uh, came into fruition, um, up in the Himalaya mountains with my niece, Dr. Aisha, who's in her 20s. Uh, we were talking about the possibility that I experienced about going into politics. My husband uh, was raised by a political campaign manager in Pakistan with a complete 100% win record, and he's been an organizer for decades, so I have this powerhouse beside me, alhamdulillah. Um, so I knew I, I, it was possible, but I wasn't sure about whether I wanted to because there's so much corruption and misdirection and criminality inside the U.S. government. Like, do I really want to wade into that? Can I really make a difference? And she said, Mommy, you know, Auntie, you are more ready than you think you are. And we, the world over, suffer for American policies. We wish we could affect them. Uh, you have that opportunity to stand up and be a voice for us and to help change things for the better for America and for the world. You know, please do so. Right. So that. That's a microcosm of the tension that we're all facing. Um, many American Muslims who immigrated here or who have family who immigrated here came here for the American dream, came here believing in liberty and justice for all, in equality and opportunity and refuge. And I often find in the immigrant communities a much clearer and, and more sincere sense of patriotism than I find among native-born Americans you know, who grow up with, inside the cognitive dissonance of being at the heart of the empire. So in this district specifically, over 30% of us here were born abroad. Like it's an incredibly immigrant heavy district. It's a majority minority uh, location, 800,000 people. And my message to the immigrant communities and the Muslim communities specifically, is if you believe in the ideals of America and you want to contribute to the future of this country, you're already American. I don't care what the paperwork says, right? My grandfather came here as a refugee after World War II. He was a Nazi concentration camp survivor and he had a pathway to citizenship open for him when my father was a child. Um, my father went on to have a stellar career with the U.S. Navy and helping the U.S. Navy um, shift its mindset or at least broaden its mindset to do disaster response and to do civic engagement um, and not just be an agent of destruction on the planet. Um, and now I'm running for Congress. So just imagine the, you, I don't have to tell you this, right? Um, but I say to folks, just imagine the, the potential we can unlock if we get rid of the racism that's deeply entering the debate at the national level about immigration and say, no, no, this is how we built America. This is how America will flourish in the future. These are some of my thoughts about why it's important to step forward. And it's important that we as Muslims make sure that we are taking our civic responsibilities seriously um, because that's how we show care um, for our ummah and for ourselves. Yeah. And so can you tell us more about um, why you have felt more specifically um, passionate about being vocal about your disapproval of the incumbent Adam Smith 
who um, seems to have much of his campaign backed by the American Israel Public Affairs Committee um, and his, you know, what that means for his support of the Israeli government and the atrocities they are committing, not only in Gaza, but now in the Middle East. Um, so as an American Muslim running for Congress, uh, why do you feel it's necessary to um, call him out on these biases? People don't know, and they need to know. We need to know. Uh, you mentioned APAC, that is his single largest donor, OpenSecrets.org, has full disclosure on all of that. Um, but it's not just APAC. He gets 95% of his campaign funding from the Israel lobby and the defense contractors, who I like to call the war profiteers, because that's what they are. Um, they're the companies whose stock has spiked since Israel invaded Lebanon a few days ago. right? And they're the ones who've been profiting off this whole mess. Uh, with our tax money, we see essential needs going unmet in our own communities while our tax money is being sent abroad to kill kids. And Adam Smith will give lip service to a ceasefire, but at the end of the day, that's still how he's voting. And that needs to be on the, the table. It needs to be on the conversation. Um, everybody needs to be aware that, I mean, nobody's surprised that money in politics is a corrupting influence and has been forever, but especially since Citizens United when I was a kid. Um, but now it's gotten to such a level that I feel a, a, a sense of personal moral injury if I don't speak up. And I can't live with myself if I don't step up and challenge this and do everything I can to bring awareness to it. Um, we would be serving American integrity, American communities, the betterment of the world, and our own laws, right, and international laws. If we stood up and said, no, we have standards. We actually legally have standards for what our money is going to be used for, and we have moral priorities. And the only way to make this change is to take power away from those who are using it to abuse and to harm our communities and other communities abroad and step up and say power can be used for good. Power in itself is not moral or immoral. You know, I, I was raised with the mindset of, oh, money and power are the root of all evil. No, no, money and power amplify whatever they are used for and whatever the character of that human or that intention is. So if we trust ourselves, and as Muslims, I believe we should, if we have good intentions and good integrity and, and clear guidance and a clear moral compass, absolutely we should have power and it will be to the benefit of our communities and every other community for us to do so so smith in particular is is a, a really extraordinarily clear example of how apac and the war industry buy influence and he's a democrat right this is not a partisanship issue um, this is an integrity issue government should be of by and for the people that's one of the things we agree on as Americans, right? Along with liberty and justice for all, ensuring that everyone has life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like these are fundamental values that unite us. Uh, and because it's upholding the constitution, including fundamental freedoms of speech and assembly. Smith has been formally condemned and censured by the 43rd LD Democrats here in Washington state, his own party, the strongest LD in Washington state for the Seattle Democrats, uh, because of his, his words against peaceful protesters, people who were exercising their right their, their First Amendment rights. Um, he also voted for the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, quote unquote, um, which was structured so that it criminalized free speech on college campuses. Like this is not someone who we can allow to have power. I can't take on the entire Congress. You know, I can only do one at a time and speak for my communities and, and you know, offer them an alternative. Um, but Alhamdulillah, we have won the primary and that's something I really want folks to know. Um, this was not a race that I knew I was running six months ago. Like we started this in mid-April, and we have made it through the primaries as the first Muslim candidate in Washington state history to do so at a federal level. Uh, there is a lot of appetite for grassroots, principled, non-career politician um, folks to step up. And so I would say that is a message of encouragement, uh, really fierce encouragement um, to anyone period, but especially to anyone in the American Muslim community um, who is even considering this, go for it. Try, right? Reach out to your communities. You, you may well be very surprised. Um, and if running for office seems like a stretch at this point, get involved at the local level. Become a precinct committee officer. Learn how the system works from the inside. Um, PCO positions, at least in our area, half of them are vacant. Um, you can usually get appointed for your local neighborhood organizer um, just by asking, just by standing up. And I support that with either party, by the way. You know, personally, I'm a lifelong Democrat. 
Democrat um, with a lot stronger peace tendencies than the establishment Democrat Party happens to be. Um, but across the political spectrum, like folks need to be stepping up to represent our communities. Um, we have, no one else is going to do it for us. Right, and that brings us to an interesting point. Um, I'm sure you're well aware that um, American Muslims often vote for the Democratic Party, um, many of whom have become disillusioned, you know, hesitant to cast their vote uh, for this party who is actively um, standing in solidarity with Israel um, through its military aid, the Biden administration has has aided this government that is committing these atrocities. Um, so, I mean, how can we, or, or you, us, anyone, ease these voters' concerns that possibly um, the VP, you know, Harris would fall in line with this loyalty? Um, or should voters be looking for that third party vote? So a few months ago, I, so I've been involved in the organizing for the uncommitted movement here in Washington state, um, basically since its inception. And my husband was one of the founders in that early effort. I was still in Pakistan at the time. Um, we have been looking, and I use the term we very broadly, um, people of conscience have been looking for the Democratic Party to take a strong position on this and back it up meaningfully. And we haven't seen that. Um, we saw the DNC deny a Palestinian speaker two minutes on stage, despite her message being a very unifying and gentle one, uh, let alone continuing to send tens of billions of dollars to Israel in the form of weapons, which profit the political donor class, unfortunately, um, and which are being used to slaughter kids uh, with our money and, and therefore by extension in our name. So I encourage everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, um, to take a really close look at our moral responsibility here and to remember that the power lies with us. The power lies with the voters. Um, it doesn't actually lie with the big political parties. It lies with the big political parties to the extent that they can convince us to go along with their program and, and to vote for them. Um, I have not seen any meaningful shift from Harris on the issue that matters most to me. So I am evaluating my options carefully. Um, I encourage people of conscience to vote your conscience because the lesser of two evils, continuing to vote for the lesser of two evils will only shift the Overton window of, of who we can elect worse and worse. Just those, those options get more and more evil over time, um, as evidenced by Dick Cheney, uh, one of the most hated men of, of my early political awareness, um, endorsing Kamala Harris and her coming out and being proud of that. That's a challenge. Um, I do see the Democratic Party as being on the right side of many issues domestically, um, but this is one where I think we can't afford to stay silent. I think it's very important to be seen to have standards, uh, to be sh to show unity and principle and numbers. Um, and I'm aware, um, just credit Kudus Sami Hamdi for some of this analysis, um, that if the Green Party gets 5% of the vote nationwide, they get on the ballot in all 50 states in 2028. Um, there is a strategic consideration to be made for potentially building power in the long term um, by making that shift. Uh, and I encourage people to explore what's possible there. But I also want to shift focus away from the top of the ticket a bit, uh, because APAC and the Israel lobby, they know very clearly that both people at the top of the ticket um, are on their side, basically, or are, are not going to seriously challenge um, Israel's influence or the flow of U.S. weapons to Israel. What APAC is worried about is down ballot races, specifically congressional ones. Um, they have spent well over $100 million, an unprecedented amount of money, to influence congressional elections in the primaries across the country. Why? If they're so, if, if the top of the ticket's taken care of, why would they spend all that money? Well, it's because they can't be seen to lose. They cannot afford to lose the veneer of invincibility that has kept them in power this long, that has kept their congressional allies towing the line this long. As soon as someone publicly loses, who is majorly supported by Israel, and as soon as that's a key reason for their loss, then everyone else in Congress starts to take a second look at how closely they're following APAC's um, requests, shall we say, and whether that money is really worth it. So that is the conversation that we need to force, right? We need to be able to um, exert power sufficiently um, to make that loss clear and, and very visible. Um, at that point, the entire balance of power inside this country changes. And um, I think that's something we're all looking forward to. 
Well, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Chaudhry. I would like to move on to a more economic issue, a more domestic issue, um, specifically concerning workers' rights. Um, Port workers have just gone on strike along the East and the Gulf Coast. Um, They're striking for better wages along with other demands, uh, similar to strikes that we've seen across the country in multiple industries, um, including the airline industry, um, Boeing Airlines. You were um, supportive of these workers who strike there. What can be said about, um, you know, the income disparity that is leading to these strikes and how can we ad- address this issue? At a macroeconomic level, wages have stagnated for the la- or declined in real terms, you know, inflation adjusted terms for over 50 years. Um, there is no way or through this economic moment without really grappling with that fact. Um, the United States currently has levels of income inequality that are higher than the ones that triggered the French Revolution. And I think that's something we should all take very seriously. There are, there are peaceful ways through this moment, and there are ways that are perhaps not peaceful. And I don't think any of us want our society to go down that path. I certainly don't. The, the fact that we have billionaires not paying anything in taxes um, when, you know, little nonprofit grant writers like myself are, you know, at $40,000 a year or whatnot, because I'm not coming into this from wealth. I'm not a career politician uh, in either case. This is something that we have to grapple with. Um, workers are the foundation of the prosperity and profitability of any company, whatever size. And investing in those workers, trusting them, believing them, um, uplifting them, and I would argue indexing CEO pay to entry-level worker pay uh, would go a long way to alleviating these pressures. We don't need to have our societies disrupted with strikes. What we need is for everyone to be well compensated, peacefully productive, and appreciated in their work. Um, and appreciated is a very tangible thing to me. Um, one of the issues, I was on the picket line, as you know, um, with the Boeing workers here in Washington State, in our district, and they were saying that one of their biggest problems was the removal of quality control. Like they want to have accountability for the products that they're making, that their names are attached to, um, that the company depends on, And that, as you know, Boeing has been receiving a lot of flack for, like there have been major scandals about quality control that are that are threatening the company's pretty much existence. Um, That's not the right time to cut worker pay and stop listening to the people who are actually producing the airplanes. That's the time to invest in those people and encourage them to be producing very high quality airplanes and making sure that from the ground up, uh, from the the factory floor up, um, this company is rebuilt internally without needing to collapse externally. Uh, The workers don't want the company to go down. They want the company to strengthen itself and listen to them and and for there to be this sense of shared mission. The idea that that CEOs are are somehow able to benefit um, or exit at the expense of the people they leave behind, the workers, if this uh, comes apart, that's not good, right? And I see that, that mindset playing out across labor movement um, more broadly and across these other strikes, as you point out. Um, Boeing is very top of mind here locally. Um, my husband was a, a labor organizer. His father, as well as being a political organizer, was a labor organizer, um, all the way up to being the leader of a couple hundred thousand people um, across the financial unions in both Bangladesh and Pakistan when those were one country. Um, all the tellers, right? all the frontline people where their CEOs were seeing 800% increases in pay and they got maybe 5%. right? That's not fair. This is a matter of fairness, and that's an intrinsic drive, you know, fitra, um, for all human beings. Um, That's all I see in this, is a question of what is fair, uh, what is just, and what will lead to a long-term future um, where everyone gets to thrive, including the people at the top of the company. Yeah, and moving on to um, specifically women's health care rights, the topic of abortion is on the ballot this November. Um, your home state of Washington plans to keep its abortion stockpile, especially in case of a, another Trump presidency, which has been um, e- not super concrete in its um, abortion policy. You know, it has threatened a national abortion ban, uh, but 
Trump and J.D. Vance kind of go back and forth on this, so it's it's unclear to us, you know, what their stance on this issue is. Um, however, as we know, this issue is currently in the hands of states. Um, but I think what voters are really grappling with is how should this issue really be handled? I mean, should we leave it up to states? Should it be federally protected? Um, can you give us some insight to this? Sure. So, first of all, I think Trump and Vance are lying because they know that their stance on abortion is unpopular and that stance is on the record and they would like to pull that wool over voters' eyes. Speaking as a Muslim and speaking to the Muslim community, in an ideal world, we would not need to have abortion access. Uh, however, we do not live in an ideal world and we do not live in an ideal country. And right now, access to abortion and other forms of reproductive health care is health care. And we are already seeing women who are dying because they're partway through a miscarriage and they can't get the simple couple of pills that it would take to help their body expel that already deceased fetus and for them to survive. And instead they're getting sepsis and they're dying. And some of these women are mothers, right? These are women who have other kids, who have a future and who, who have responsibilities and obligations. We need to nurture the sanctity of life including the women who are bearing it, who are already alive, who have matured and are taking care of people and have futures of their own. Um, so making sure, I, I'll, I'll quote my mother actually, um, one of the things she, she taught me when I was young, um, keep abortion safe, legal, and rare is the, the ideal scenario um, here in a, a very mixed culture, a very mixed society. Um, we cannot be in the position of imposing our moral preferences on other people. We must be in the position of protecting bodily and physical autonomy of all, all people. And that includes the right to make personal health care decisions free of government interference. Um, having abortion, um, quote unquote, at the state level might be able to be okay simply because, okay, from my perspective, um, simply because the majority of Americans will step up to, to protect this. And there have been Supreme Court cases and constitutional amendments at the state level um, where these really draconian um, six-week bans and other things like that um, have been challenged and have been overturned. So I have some confidence in the American people. Um, I, would feel, I would feel more comfortable for our country um, if Roe v. Wade were back in place or something stronger. Um, and, and again, that's speaking personally. Um, I don't say that that's a position that all Muslims should take, but that is where I stand on this issue. And moving on to my last question, um, the last point I want to touch on is education and um, the current literary crisis that our children, our youth are facing, um, many of whom are not reading at their grade level. What can be a congressional approach to this issue? Constitutionally speaking, the bulk of educational funding comes from the state level, um, as do decisions on curriculum. From the co congressional federal level, um, we have responsibility for quality control through the Department of Education, and we also provide funding for many of the more special education type of programs, supplementary support. Um, I want to make sure that that in particular is a real focus. Um, we need to make sure that starting at the child care level, starting at the, the preschool and pre-K level, um, we're investing in our kids and we're investing in our communities to have those kids in high quality educational spaces. Um, this is one financial need that we have here at home um, that we could be fully meeting if we were taxing extreme wealth and right-sizing our quote-unquote defense budget, um, which has been a war of aggression budget at least as long as I've been alive. The need as well, I want to say a few words about COVID, um, the need to compensate for multiple years of children, especially small children's very formative um, social and academic development um, that was stifled um, through lack of social contact and through these lockdowns and through school closures. Um, that's something that we're going to be reckoning with as a society for a long time. Uh, and I don't believe at the moment we have sufficient just human power, just human cap capacity, you know, people in these jobs um, who are reasonably trained in early childhood education and psychology and helping these kids get through this phase um, and continue to develop. Um, there's great programs out there. We just need a lot more people in them, graduating from them, and then money to staff positions um, and pay them to take care of these kids um, and help them come up to speed. Um, it's incredibly important. You know, we've, we've seen the studies showing that at thir you know, third grade reading level is like the predictor for long-term success, educational achievement, graduating from high school and college, all these things. Uh, that's 
both scary and it's very, very good and very important to know where to invest and where we need to be making sure um, that these kids are, are up to a level that they need to be at. Um, I love working with kids. Um, in an earlier iteration, I, I did childcare and I was you know, around kids a lot of the time um, and they soak it up as much as much appreciation and love and guidance as we can give them, um, they are sponges for. Uh, as any healthy society with a long-term sustainable trajectory is gonna recognize that and pour as much into our young people as we possibly can. Um, I think the fact that we have been slacking on that front um, is long-term, you know, slow societal suicide, right? We need to be taking care of our young people. Um, they are the future. It's a, it's a cliche because it's true. Well, thank you again, Ms. Chowdhury, for joining us today. Um, would you like to share any closing remarks or tell the audience where they might reach you? Certainly, yes. Um, first of all, I'm grateful to everyone who's listening and who cares about the future of our country um, and taking that on from a, from a Muslim perspective, especially. Um, I, that's a, a bold and morally courageous move. And the more people, more of us do it, um, I think the stronger America is going to be um, and our Ummah. I can be found at vote melissa one l two s's and the l i s s a four numeral four congress dot com again vote melissa for congress dot com um, in there there's my link tree where you can find me on social media um, including Substack and a number of other places most of my organizing is local um, so if you don't see me too active online that's because I'm out there talking to voters in my district and making sure that I understand um, the concerns they have that I can address at the federal level and make sure that we improve life for everyone um, but that's how you reach me um, I am very much appreciate the chance to speak with you all right wonderful thank you so much this is Dr. Lecker. take care